pass it over to Craig. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. Uh, so my name is Craig. I'm a solutions architect at Databricks, and I've had the pleasure of working with the activity platform team at Salesforce for the past year as they built out their engagement Delta Lake or engagement activity Delta Lake. Uh, so uh, I'd like to give them the floor briefly so that they can uh, each introduce themselves. Uh, Aaron, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, uh, I'm Aaron. I'm a principal engineer on the activity platform team. I've been with uh, Salesforce for slightly over six years. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be uh, the panelist, so I'll answer most of your questions. Okay. Awesome. Heng, uh, do you want to go next? Hi, my name is Heng, and I work in Salesforce for four years. And uh, I'm in the activity platform team for one and a half years. And uh, um, I'm interested in microservice, uh, distributed system, and big data. And uh, I'm also one of the panelists um, in the talk series. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Leo, next. Hey guys, uh, I'm Leo. Uh, I've been working with Salesforce for about uh, two years, or, or, almost three years, I would say. And my passion is about working with uh, big data at huge scale, with like high complexity data and high velocities as well. And so I will be the panelist to answer questions with Aaron today. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, so, you want to go? I'm Zidong. I um, have been working in Salesforce for almost for more than four years. I'm a principal engineer here and uh, passionate on building big data, pipeline, distributed system, and uh, microservice. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, so uh, one note before we get started. Uh, so uh, Denny, uh, one of our developer advocates, uh, Chris, who is another one of our solutions architects, uh, and I will be monitoring the Q&A on Zoom. LinkedIn and YouTube. So uh, please ask any and all questions that you have. All right, Saddam, uh, please go ahead. Cool. So can, can you see my screen? Uh, we cannot. How about now? Perfect. Awesome. This looks great. Cool. Hi, uh, so today we are going to talk about our journey of the building engagement activity Delta Lake in Salesforce to support Einstein analytics. Um, here is the agenda we are going through. So first we will cover what is uh, engagement activity Delta Lake in Salesforce and why we are building it. And uh, then we will go through the high level architecture and the system design we have and then how we support our customer requirement for incremental read and how our jobs achieve exact what's right across tables in multiple rights. And after this, I will talk about the challenge of using the mute, handling mutations in Delta Lake, including um, especially for GDPR, data policy, and the user mutation request and uh, the opt some optimization we have for the cascading mutations and uh, using graph detection and the normalize the table in the Delta Lake. So last, we will also have a brief introduce the performance challenge we have and uh, the solution. We will also keep some time at the end of this section for the Q and A. Yeah, let's get started. So at Salesforce, our customers are using high velocity sales, also known as HVS, to intelligently convert leads and uh, create new opportunities. We build engagement activity platform to automatically capture and store user engagement activities. The engagement Delta Lake is uh, one of the key components that supporting Einstein analytic, creating powerful reports and dashboards and sales Einstein for, training, for machine learning model training. And uh, this amount of uh, data can only be scaled uh, using engagement activity Delta Lake, which built on top of uh, the Delta Lake. So here is uh, some key use case of uh, engagement Delta Lake. So say salesperson, um, so 
like a salesperson can like use his engagement metrics and the rates to uh, identify which kingdoms or template is more effective. And uh, for example, in engagement dashboard, uh, we easily can get like uh, how many emails uh, sent, opened, or delivered easily from this dashboard on the left side. And also salesperson can also get like how many phone calls um, like uh, are meaningful or connect on like just uh, customers say not in chest or just left voicemail. So for any date, any sales rep. So we leave with this engagement dashboard to drive intelligence into sales productivity. Uh, with all these uh, use case from our product manager, we convert them into our technical requirements. Uh, we break down, um, first, our downstream consumer needs um, incremental reach, right? As well as the batch read from the Delta Lake. Our customers pull data. Um, one customer pull the data from our Delta Lake periodically and could uh, generate the snapshots for layer downstream. So one of the like a uh, special case use case for our Delta Lake is uh, our Delta Lake is uh, mutable. Unlike the activity uh, data lake we built before, everything is uh, immutable. So which bring in a lot of challenging for us. We will talk about this uh, in the uh, later. And also the most key point for users trust is uh, our Delta Lake need to respect to the GDPR and the data policy that the users have. So after a long discussion and uh, with PM, with our engineers, with our architects, we come up with this uh, high level architecture. So we basically break down this uh, uh, pipeline into two components. Uh, one is uh, like uh, the injection on the left side, and there is uh, the mutation pipeline, mutation related pipeline on the right side, like a uh, user mutation, GDPR, or data policy related for deletions. So we capture, we capture the user engagement data and the push them into our uh, internal Kafka queue, which is heavily used in Salesforce for the data transform transfer. And uh, our Spark job will read from the Kafka queue or in the injection pipeline and start injecting the data and the batch them into the Delta Lake, Delta table. We call it the uh, data table at this point. And to start with, the data table is uh, just partitioned by organization ID and uh, the date of the engagement. So uh, to, on the right side is the mutation. So we built another very similar pipeline as um, injection pipeline. So to support uh, the mutation requires from the customer. And uh, uh, once we get a request, we apply uh, this uh, deletion or updates to the data table. So the first question when we design the Spark job is uh, which mode should we use in Spark job? Should we use a structured streaming mode? Should we use a batch mode? So right now, our job is mostly for batch processing, but to keep it flexible and extendable in future, we choose the structure streaming with a micro batch mode. There are a few benefits we have. One is uh, it supports auto scaling very well uh, with Databricks cluster, which means uh, the cost of saving. And second, as most of our jobs are consuming from Kafka, we need offset for and the metadata information for checkpointing. We also find that our job sometimes finished earlier, I mean, in our POC stage. So to, from the cost saving perspective, 
we also uh, use the, we, we choose to use the trigger ones. To, that means your job, uh, once your job finish, your cluster will be shut down and uh, for the period of time. And here your next uh, schedule was up and uh, your job will be ramp up again and uh, it's killed the next batch to save some cost. So the Delta API is uh, quite powerful. It comes with the native support for batch read, such as uh, time range query from T1 to T2, give me all the data, uh, or like uh, organization level check, uh, organization level uh, query, like return me all the data for this organization. Yeah, it just support this. It also supports incremental reads as the name it tells Delta. So return me all the data, uh, all the Delta data since the last checkpoint. But it has a condition that it only, um, it only supports for the append only mode uh, data. But as I just mentioned, uh, our data table is uh, mutable which uh, doesn't qualify for this condition. So we have to come up with our own design for the incremental read. So uh, we create, so how can we support this incremental read? We create a separate table called a notification table, which is also partitioned by organization ID and the injection time stamp. So when new data come in, new engagement data insert into our data table, or when existing engagement data is update or delete, we will notify our downstream consumer of all oh, these sort of changes. And uh, this is a uh, new data. And by inserting a new entry into our engagement metadata into our notification table, the downstream consumer can also uh, either you use a streaming mode, listen to our notification table, or you, you can use a batch mode, periodically query our notification table to get the, what is new. Once you get what is new based uh, of, for the, all the data, you just get the key, then you use the key to fetch from our data table for the real data you may have. So that kind of uh, solved our problem for incremental read. And uh, we found uh, this design pattern fit into a lot of our jobs because we have a lot of jobs that require a similar uh, requirements. So we, we create a generic uh, notification table. Here is the class led off uh, uh, for our notification table. As you can see, it has organization ID, engagement date is when the engagement happened, the table name, which, uh, which table has updates, deletes, or um, uh, new data. The modified time is when, the when, when our job receives the data. And we also keep some uh, counters like update count, insert count, delete count, just for the auditing perspective, as well as the metadata. Now you don't have to query the data table if you just want some like a count for like how many uh, data was deleted or how many data was generated, how many data was updated easily from this table very efficient way. Also, we keep the app name because this table is kind of shared across uh, multiple jobs. So this, uh, we need to keep what uh, job, what is the app name that's right into this notification. So as you know, like we uh, use Delta Lake and then we store the data in uh, data lake is uh, like a high level um, database that build can build on top of uh, some data storage. 
So we choose to use uh, S3 as our underneath uh, data file system. So it's all about like, uh, we're curious, just curious like uh, how these files hierarchy is uh, underneath behind the scene of the table. Because for the table, you just get to know all this query and this is the, uh, the data you returned. So we took a look at of our data table and the notification table. And we found that here is an example of our data, um, data file hierarchy. As you can see, the prefix is uh, defined by us and it has partition key like organization. Here is organization equal to two and engagement date is all partition key. And underneath uh, implementation for the file is uh, parquet. And uh, each parquet file may contain some many, many file, many, many records. And uh, the Delta also keep a, a magic called the Delta law, which stores all the commits as well as the metadata and your job status in this, uh, under this Delta log folder. So which support us for the ASIC transactions with one right. And as you can see, there's uh, be a lot of many, many, a lot of uh, JSON files under this folder. So one key point highlight here is, uh, you see is uh, two days here. One is a modified time, one is engagement date. So for notification table, we use modified time. So our downstream consumer can use that time to checkpoint. Say you want like last time uh, when from any time point, you want the data, uh, the Delta data from that point. And uh, because uh, the use case is more, uh, the use case for data table is more like a uh, customer wants the, the engagement when the data, when the engagement happened in the data table. So we use engagement date for the partition key. Cool. So, so here is uh, um, the common question, uh, common problems uh, we when we designed a distributed system. What if uh, your job failed, right? So, but always uh, need to consider. We always need to consider like how we improve our fault tolerance for the distributed system, and then Spark does doesn't provide atomic APIs and or ASIC transactions natively. But fortunately, the Delta API supports ASIC transaction. As I just mentioned, it uses the Delta law to make this magic. So it is uh, uh, like, a, like a, the Delta Lake, it's as just mentioned, it's like a um, ordered record of every transaction that has been performed on the Delta Lake since its uh, inception. And the Delta break this uh, operation into atomic actions and it will only commit um, all transaction, all actions, uh, when all actions are uh, uh, successfully complete. So when our write failed, the job will just need to retry. It's not worry about any uh, data uh, data loss, but is it enough for our use case? Probably not enough. Well, uh, because while we are introducing the notification table, solving our incremental read problem, it also creates another challenger for us. We found that, like um, our jobs tries to process like uh, um, writes into two tables. So Delta API suppose the ASIC transaction within each table. So there's a no batch transaction uh, support across multiple tables because now we have writes, uh, two writes to two tables. So let's go through this uh, uh, example, see what is uh, the issue we are facing. So for example, in this case, Let's say our Spark job first write to data table, then write to notification table. So if the write successfully write into the data table, 
but when while writing to notification table, the downstream uh, the fail, I mean, the fail to write to notification table, the downstream consumer will completely miss the batch since it doesn't get a notification. It may get catch up if they query directly to the data table, but they will miss the real time uh, notification. So what about, let's say the other way, the Spark job first to write to notification table, then write to data table later. So if the job successfully write to notification table, but fails write to data table, what will happen? That means uh, our downstream will get the notification and query the data, uh, the data table. It couldn't find anything. And since it writes to data table failed, they may, we may lose the data forever. So we need a design. We need a design to provide, we call it the um, exact ones right across multiple tables, which requires like any right to table operation in a transaction. If we failed, we will not commit if there is any failed right, our job will only repossess it. And we definitely need to, uh, so to support this, we definitely need to save uh, the metadata very similar as our data log and includes the state of each right and include the last six check uh, point. So, and since, as you can see, uh, our source is mostly from Kafka and we need to store the checkpointing for the Kafka. So how are we, uh, how do we resolve this problem? Uh, we first uh, create a checkpoint store because we use a Kafka checkpoint store to store the star and offset and the, some metadata of the Kafka, like broker list and uh, some topics names, and uh, also the last job state for given checkpoint, which is a very key point when we need to uh, resume from the last checkpoint. So the first task of our Spark job is to read the store, uh, read from the checkpoint store and get the last checkpoint metadata and the last job state. So since our job is queued in a micro batch mode, each batch will include multiple process, like a process like the write data to table one, write it to table two, three, and so on. We also need to store the batch state, like uh, what is the job uh, is a job failed or succeed for this uh, job, uh, this process, or we call it right. And the process name, so we each job we will name it, each process we will have a name. And timestamp, last modified time. So after reading from the checkpoint store, Spark will get the last job state. If the last batch was uh, completely successfully, successfully executed, the job will increase the last batch ID. Otherwise, it will uh, use keep the last batch ID. Then our Spark job will fetch, uh, and our Spark job will fetch the metadata based on the job name. It seems complicated, but let's do a quick view of our metadata, and we will dig into uh, this uh, with one example. So these are like a, a example of our batch metadata store table. So as you can see, we have a um, job name. In this case, it's injection job and the batch ID, which provided by Spark API. In this case, we have a nine and a 10 for these uh, two process. And the process name, one is an injection job, one is a, the job process, process for right to notification table. And the last modified timestamp, these are when your job is queued. So let's go through uh, one like flow for happy bars. So first 
our Spark job will get the current batch ID. Uh, in this case, is uh, like a 10, 10 from, I mean, from the Spark checkpoint store. Then you also fetch our batch metadata store to get the batch ID of the last process. In our case, it's 10, 10. Let's say these are uh, matched all these are like a spark may provide you new batch right so these are matched that means uh your job your last run job was like a like a completely 100 percent success for both process so you will just uh, need to, so that means we can resume our next to our next batch so you read from the spark checkpoint store to get the, na uh, the latest uh, offset uh, from the uh, on the Kafka and uh, process this batch as a new batch. These are happy parts. So once your process complete, depends on your job status, you save the batch metadata back to the Spark checkpoint store and the checkpointing to the metadata store. So what about the unhappy parts? Like uh, what if there is any failure in between, right? So again, it's a uh, very similar that the Spark uh, will get this um, first fetch from the uh, checkpointing store and the batch metadata store. So now in this case, you see the injection job has batch ID 10 and the injection data notification has a batch ID nine. That means that uh, data notification rights may failed in last run or it, it is failed. So it didn't consume, it didn't resume to the next new batch. Instead, it will read the last batch data from the Kafka. And uh, since the data injection job completely succeeds, it will skip the data injection process and just directly jump into the data notification uh, process. So right into data notification. And after job complete, it will do the similar thing as the happy path, save the batch metadata and the checkpointing back to the Spark checkpoint store and the batch metadata store. So what do we have achieved with this design? We are able to perform like exact ones, right? And uh, if there's any failure, we would like to just retry and only retry the specific process. No duplicates, right? And then no data lost. Yeah, so here, here we are pretty much covered our injection pipeline part. But as I mentioned earlier, our engagement data is uh, mutable. As we know, um, mutation operation is a uh, way more expensive operation than injection in batch jobs. So our data, also our data has to respect to the data policy, GDPR, uh, like TTL, organization delete, user delete, or data subject delete. And the mutation request is all based on ID field, which may or may not be the primary key of our data. For example, you change, unless it requires coming in say, oh, change all records from with ID one to ID two. And this mutation could also be cascaded. Like uh, you user say, oh, I want to change this ID. Like from the user perspective, he changed the cascading for example, a cascade, uh, um, a kingdom's ID one and change kingdom's again, change it again. So it will be a cascade mutation to our data, uh, data end. Like uh, it will be translating to like from request uh, uh, ID one to ID two, then ID two to ID three, then ID three to ID four. It just, it is a corner case, but we have to consider this and cover these cases. So as our design is all based on distributed system, so injection and the mutation requests may just come asynchronously. So there are two scenarios um, 
when we apply updates or deletes into our data table. The happy pairs, everyone is happy. The data, the data engagement data itself comes uh, same uh, before the mutation requires come in. But there will be an unhappy part that data is still, the engagement data is still in flight. So it's not yet reached the data table, but the requires, the mutation requires come in. What are we going to do? There's no data here. Are we going to wait or are we going to uh, drop the mutation request? So these are like one challenge for us. So the solution is to um, add another table. We call it a mutation, mutation retry table, as you can see here. So every time when our mutation job wake up periodically, it not only read from the mutation request table, but also read from the mutation retry table. Now, first, instead of uh, directly apply the mutation updates or deletes directly to the data table, first, it will check whether my data exists. That means uh, uh, your data could be in flight or could already uh, land it in your data table. So the two cases, one, if the data exists based on the key check, like uh, ID1 or ID2 exists, okay, I will apply the mutation. And if the key doesn't exist, that means your data could still in the, in the chain. So you, you just save this request into retry table for, for the next run. So uh, that kind of uh, solved our uh, problem for the unsynchronized uh, um, problem issue. But with this, uh, but as we just mentioned, mutation could also be cascaded. And we have to maintain kind of this kind of uh, ordering of a mutation request. As you know, like when we apply the batch, there isn't a guarantee for the ordering. So we have to come up with something. And uh, the one solution is, uh, okay, I will just break this down into multiple uh, operations. I will just execute them one by one. But as you can, as you all know, each operation in Spark jobs, it will produce a new file, or at least it will increase the number of IOs. That will incredibly reduce your performance. And uh, we also run into this performance issue, and we will talk about that later. So the goal is uh, to reduce the mutation operations as little as possible. For example, uh, we get a request, three requests. One is uh, for ID1, change the workflow ID1 to ID2. Second is change ID2 to ID3, then change ID3 to ID4. And in our data table, we have a uh, one record with a workflow ID1. So the eventual goal is just like change this ID1 to ID4. How are we going to achieve that? We can do this one by one, or we can have some optimizations. Yeah, so we come up with an uh, um, algorithm. We use a graph to detect the cascading changes. So first, in order to uh, execute this uh, again, um, this uh, first, we were just a uh, uh, group them by organization because our scope is always by organization. And uh, we sort this by mutation execution time. Then for each group, we use a Spark Graph API to detect the graph. Uh, we will go through this diagram on the next slide and we found the uh, uh, node and ages. So age is the request and we find all kind of uh, connected components. Then we go through the con all connected components and find the final state of each node. And then after this, we kind of drop all the intermediate state of the re cascading request then convert the connected component back to the list of requests that Spark can understand. Then apply this in a batch. 
Here is one example that uh, to iterate this. So first we group by organization ID. So in this case, there are two organizations. One have uh, three requests, uh, ID one, two, three, change to two, three, four, and one request for ID one, ID two. And we use this uh, to build a graph, also, also can call it a subgraph for, for each organization. And in this case, we see this uh, ID one, ID three, ID three to ID four, and uh, so on. And for organization two, the subgraph just have ID one to ID two. So after convert, uh, after the computation, we figure out that the organization one just need to change ID one to ID M, and uh, all ID two to ID M, and all ID three to all ID M. And for organization two, we found that all ID one just need to change to ID two. So this is the list of requests after uh, the computation and it can be understand by our Spark API and that can be applied in a batch to the data table. So, but uh, this kind of uh, solved all kind of uh, optimize our batch uh, right and uh, reduce a huge amount of uh, files um, because we reduce the amount of the request and uh, mutation request, intermediate the mutation request. But still, as we mentioned, mutation request volume is very, very high which impact is almost like a 20% to 30% of injection volume, which impact our performance a lot. So we took a close uh, look into our data shape and we found there's a lot of records need to mutate for only one request. For example, uh, request is like a change the name and T table uh, like, a, workflow name one to workflow name two, can touch like thousands or millions of uh, records in our data table. So also bring in the SLA concern. So we have this uh, um, solution called normalize, just like our relation database. We also can normalize this uh, um, table in our data lake by split, uh, splitting or extract some uh, fields out of the data table. In this case, we uh, split out the SID, TID. Uh, we have a SID, TID, SNAME, and the TNAME. We break out uh, into SID and TID in data table. And we will just keep ID mapping in the mapping, we call it mapping table. And the user will when you use a query hour, um, say we want to um, mutate from the ID, SID1 to SID2, we only need to touch one record in the data table. Uh, in the data table. And if we want to change the name, like change the name as name to as name one, so you only need to touch the mapping table and you don't have to touch uh, millions of records in the data table, which is safe a lot in our performance perspective. Cool. So finally, uh, we, we have our first version of pipeline running in staging end-to-end -end with injection job, mutation job, with a high fault tolerance and the downstream consumers can either read in a batch mode or incremental, incremental mode. And uh, most of the corner cases has been covered. So it's time to run some stress test. And due to time limit, I will just briefly discuss that. So basically the common problem we, when we're dealing with a Spark job is the injection and the mutation produce a lot of small files for small orgs. And the mutation job isn't fast for us to meet the, our SRA from a product perspective. And also the mutation job create a lot of tombstone files which is also costly and the performance concern. Our quick view of the solution is uh, first, we can tune the partition scheme and from org and date 
just in uh, into just org only and leverage the delta data skipping and the ordering feature and set up another job to run the delta optimize and enable auto optimize for injection and uh, mutation jobs. To clean up those uh, tombstone files, we also scheduled a vacuum job as a nightly job, which will clean up rows to save our money. Last but not least, we can also tune the spark.default pair reasons to have a better read and the right pair reasons. We will have a deep dive uh, in our next section for the boost delta lake performance with data skipping and the ordering by hand. Well, you are very welcome to come back. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much, Zidong. This is really cool. Uh, so Karen, yeah, let's switch back to speaker or gallery mode. We've got a lot of really great questions from everybody here. We'll try our best to answer them, but we only have about, I'd say five to eight minutes left. So I just want to be very clear to call that out. So if we don't answer your question, uh, we'll do our best to actually go ahead and uh, follow up with a, a, do a follow up blog actually to help with that as well anyways. So saying this, uh, I want to ask the first set of questions and then between Craig and myself, uh, we're, we'll toss back and forth questions. So the first question I'll ask, and this one I'm going to direct to Aaron, um, is the downstream data pulled from the engagement activity Delta Lake in real time? So that's to you, Aaron. Yeah, so uh, the short answer is no, it is not real time. Um, so the, as Zudong had mentioned, the Delta, the data lake, that is built on Delta uh, is actually updated once every hour. And the downstream uh, consumer requirement, which is basically the, the Einstein analytics dashboard that you see, um, it is actually not meant to be a real time analytics reporting kind of thing. It's supposed to be like an aggregated view that you know salespeople go in and check, I don't know, once or twice a day. So we actually update it uh, once every four hours. So the downstream uh, consumers pull the data only once every four hours. Awesome, thanks Aaron. Um, cool, so uh, I think for our next question, uh, we're gonna direct this toward Heng. Um, so uh, the question is, why create a table for notifications instead of consuming from Kafka directly? Um, the notification table is to track uh, all the petitions that has been changed since our last su successful batch in terms of the um, org ID, the date, and the, the operation applied, like uh, update, delete, and uh, um, insert. So with, the, with those information, our downstream can implement the incremental read uh, instead of read the whole um, petitions and uh, but only read those petitions that has been changed. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna go for the next question is, uh, this one is uh, for you, Yifeng. Um, what is the advantage of using Kafka while Spark streaming can be used to directly to create those uh, those Delta tables? And you did already answer the question in the Q&A, but I thought it'd be still appropriate to let everybody who did not see the Q&A, especially those folks on LinkedIn and YouTube, that they also know this question, hence the the call, uh, the, sure. the re-asking sure. of that question. Sure, so, so uh, we use Kafka in Activity Platform as our messaging system. So, um, and so it's used widely across the whole, um, but it's, it's just like infrastructure. And then um, it's also a persistent layer, which makes the data replayable. And I think there's no kind of, kind of conflict between the, the Kafka and the Spark streaming job. In, uh, instead, the Kafka is more like a, a replayable source for, for our Spark streaming jobs. And then for those like Kafka topics, there are other like downstream use cases that's going to subscribe to that topic. Awesome. Okay, so now we have a uh, more of a Delta specific question. Um, so uh, Chris, if you would mind answering this, um, is there some kind of absolute maximum for table retention uh, with regard to time travel? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so what I would say is that 
uh, time travel is more designed for short-term repair than it is for um, uh, maybe like snapshotting. So I think, you know, if you only wrote to your table like once a day, you can definitely have hundreds of versions in the table. Um, you can have thousands. I've seen people do time travel um, and go like a hundred thousand versions into the past. Um, but it's not equivalent to a snapshotting tool. And so I kind of look at it as like, you know, if you compare it to a database, um, you have transactions and you can roll back individual transactions, but that is separate from the concept of a database snapshot, right? And the, the idea of a snapshot is that you can go back to a very specific point in time for the database. Um, so time travel is not meant for that snapshotting use case is what I would say. Um, but uh, you can definitely use it to go back in time uh, for thousands or hundreds of thousands of versions and it, it will work. Yeah, I, I definitely would love to add to Chris, uh, Chris's uh, call out that basically for anything that's closer to snapshot, you probably wanna do something like cloning, like the database, like, like you would normally with the database, excuse me. So you would clone your Delta table. So that way it's exactly what you asked for for that, for that frozen in time piece versus oops, I screwed something up or anything like that. That's exactly what time travel is perfect for. All right, so uh, Zidon, actually I'm gonna switch the question to you now actually, because uh, there's you, you had a really good, a cool presentation, especially on this part about exactly once right across the tables, right? And um, you already presented this, but I think it, it deserves, especially from the questions we've seen, like uh, to answer the skin. Could you clarify, why did you need to do this exactly once right across multiple tables? Oh, sure. So uh, as I mentioned, um, the job can fail. I mean, one job failed or like one job failed partially. So if one job has to write to multiple tables, uh, if one of these uh, process failed, a Spark will just, uh, if you don't have this uh, mechanism, Spark will reach right from scratch and uh, either it create a duplicate write or it will just miss the existing batch. So that's why we need to create the mechanism for the exact one's write. Either uh, one to save cost, uh, one is to make sure our data never lost. Perfect, thank you very much. Hey, Craig, why don't you toss in the next question about the performance cost with Hang? Uh, sure, so uh, so Hang, uh, this question for you. So uh, can you give us a sense of what your uh, daily performance costs are to ensure that you never miss any data or you never miss uh, any writes? So from the per, uh, design perspective, uh, when we um, when we apply the mutations, uh, including a delete, update, and um, insert, we do not directly apply those requests that are coming from our upstreams Kafka. We first stage those requests into our request tables. So then we have another job to read from the request tables in micro batches to apply those requests. So uh, if the mutation job that failed, then we are able to replay um, from our request tables. That is from that is the uh, design from the design perspective. From the uh, we also uh, from the um, performance perspective, the cost is the, um, the 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 file layouts under and um, the file layouts and the, the in the file systems. Because uh, the, um, the delta lake and the hood use actually uh, use the parquet to um, store all those files, and we use S3. So if you have too many small files, then it will definitely has a negative uh, impact in terms of read and write. So we will have a detailed discussions in our second talk on to how to solve those problems using delta lake, and uh, um, yeah. Perfect. This is an excellent segue uh, since we're only got two minutes left. Uh, definitely come to our next session about how to boost your Delta Lake performance. Uh, Hank will actually be the one presenting. So Hank, thank you very much. I did want to say thank you very much to Zidong, Hank, Aaron, Liu uh, for 
this awesome session and answering all the questions and presenting for the first of our four-part series on the sales source engineering with Delta Lake. Uh, Craig and Fish, Chris, thank you very much for answering all the questions as well. Um, I think we're done for today's session. Um, so please be on the lookout. Uh, Karen, anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up today? No, I think you covered everything. Thanks so much, Denny. Um, I'll just echo that. Thanks everyone for this awesome presentation, for Craig and Fish for uh, moderating. I dropped the YouTube recording link and YouTube in, uh, in the LinkedIn and Zoom chat spaces. So uh, feel free to check that out and then join, please join the Data Plus AI online meetup group uh, to stay up to date and check out the upcoming session. So we have three more. So I hope you'll, you'll check those out. So with that, uh, thanks everyone for attending and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.